to start this last session with a summary of what I think it, in some ways is an overview of what we've discussed, some of the challenges and ways forward as well. I have to say I'm a, I'm a bit in awe or a, a, a bit overwhelmed in one way in that I'm doing this, whereas Kathy Manduka has the knowledge to um, expand perhaps and better organize. But I think the overriding commentary to all of us is that we need a pipeline. And the sooner that pipeline starts, the better with links to high school. I know that UTIG and, and industry in Texas has set up the GeoForce program that not only motivates students into geosciences careers, but that also brings um, diverse students and, and encourage, uh, supports them through high school and into university with a bit of a mentoring program as well. Many of us are involved with high school students I can say that I had a high school student intern with me. We can do whatever a university student could do in research, but they have a shorter attention span, I'd say. But well, they can make meaningful contributions to science as well. Um, so you know, increasing the pipeline. What we do with that pipeline is overarching in, to our, all of us. Um, you know, we, and advising becomes an important component of all of this, and obviously moving more into the intro classes and um, also perhaps use early examples of careers, uh, some of these career videos that John Tabor was talking about as well. And then, you know, engaging, fully engaging our students through con establishing context and engagement. We saw a wide range of examples in all of the talks today um, with early examples um, of geo examples and, and or developing geological ex and geophysical examples to be implemented in physics classes, chemistry classes, math, and biology. And here's where we could be more inclusive because HBCUs don't have geosciences departments. So instead, we'd want to attract physicists or those thinking about engineering, thinking about um, alternative science careers to consider geophysics as well. So again, uh, having these kinds of geological examples that could be incorporated could only increase the diversity in our field. Um, and then obviously the curricula, instead of looking at the content based, moving, using a backwards based approach to redesigning curricula, and as Kathy Manduka said very, <laughs> that, that the most effective way is to um, provide more practice and quantitative skills in a in many diverse settings. The, the greater the diversity, then we achieve a full transfer of learning for our student outcomes. And I think I just want to also open up the opportunity. Um, you know, some of that some stubborn folks in saying that we've done things as that we have. Maybe some of the field geology folks who are are considering it. Um, making major changes to the way that we learn. So it seems that this is a really timely discussion um, that we could think about as well. So anyway, I, I just wanted to open the discussion then with that bit of a recap here. Um, so I, I just, I, I guess what I'd say to all of you or any of you who would like to comment, we haven't mentioned explicitly increasing diversity. Um, we have a, a comment that came in from one of the, and I'll, I'll, I'll point out, not only do we have diversity um, in terms of uh, student demographics, but we also have uh, challenges that have come in. Um, one of the students, oh, so Warner Cribb uh, had a question and a comment, the pressure at state universities to have students graduate faster, it's compounded by the increasing number of community college students we see who expect to finish their four year geology degree in two years. And those have to work full time to pay their tuition, not their expenses. And so do not engage in the REU program or research experiences that we offer in the classroom. So this is a tough problem in squeezing the program. If employers want more quantitative skills, then how do we help them or how do we get these employers to talk to state uh, planners um, to, to change that trend to uh, one that's more um, reasonable in terms of the outcomes? So that was a question we hadn't answered that I think fits into this broad overview as well. And uh, yeah, the number of, I think the number is 30% of students 
at state universities, go to two-year colleges, and, and then attend state universities to complete their degree. So it's a, a very different um, situation than anything that's been discussed by those of us at, um, uh, that yeah, earlier in this meeting. So anyway, let me leave the floor open and I hope I can see Kathy wants to answer. I'm not sure why that, how I signaled that I wanted to answer, um, but uh, um, I, I think you're, I think that the last point you made, which is that we're um, always squeezing more and more and more into the curriculum and this looks impossible is a really important point. And um, we typically design from what we want to have students be able to do to what does that mean for instruction? And I wonder if this is a good time to think about um, a different kind of design for at the program level where we think about how much time we have and what's the most important things for students to leave with right, that, that we can reasonably, you know, what, how can we best use that time um, to, to teach well the most important things and then to really um, work hard on what Barb talked about, which is um, how do we support that core with um, a, the wide variety of opportunities that students need to be able to do specific different things? Yeah, I wanted to make a comment. I, I agree with what Kathy said, but also uh, one of the things that we uh, addressed in the effort I've been doing is looking at the transfer between two-year and four-year colleges and really trying to get to your colleges and for your colleges, the faculty to talk to each other to make sure that uh, the two year colleges understand what's going to be required in their sort of local university uh, for the second year. Uh, even some schools have started having uh, exchanges where faculty in the four year colleges will come in and talk in the two year colleges and vice versa and running field trips together, having uh, different kinds of projects together, getting the two-year college students to you know, interact with their freshman cohort, uh, which they will hopefully become you know, juniors with and really trying to increase that. And that also has a one way people have been really increasing the diversity because there's uh, the demographics of of two-year colleges actually reflects the demographics of that particular area. Just ask one quick question. Um, we, Sharon, are, do we lose diversity in that transfer from two-year colleges to four-year colleges? Is there a motivational factor where we're losing diversity? Uh, actually, um, we're, <laughs> I don't know the answer to your question that way. The other direction, we are increasing diversity. Certainly the schools like UT uh, El Paso and uh, Texas A&M and schools like that that have established programs uh, with junior colleges have seen that the diversity of students incoming is higher. Okay. But I don't know whether we, we're, you know, how it works in terms of losing. No, I just meant that if, if we had stronger links, would we, make it, it, would we encourage more? Um, do we lose students in the pipeline from two-year to four-year colleges because we don't have enough interaction with them? Or we could potentially increase that part of the pipeline. Yeah, I definitely think you could increase it. Um, Cindy, there's a question actually from Maya uh, Tolstoy in the qu uh, question box. I'll go ahead and uh, ask it because uh, I think it follows on to this discussion pretty well. And she uh, says, my understanding is that students from underrepresented groups and underserved communities are often interested in doing things that will have an obvious way to go back and help their community. Should we be thinking more about emphasizing and teaching geoscience skills that might address that? I mean, yes. I do think that if you get into the <laughs> things that get to the motivations of students um, uh, that, that respond or responsive to the motivations of students are, are clearly going to be more successful than things that do not. So I think that, that definitely 
definitely does seem valid. Yeah, that's one of the things we're trying to do with our our just you know slow just developing pro program. So I don't have data, but I'd be interested if anyone actually has data and other papers that that do say that. Mm -hmm. There are some, but I don't have them pulled together. Yeah. I need to do that. Um, I, I will say that from Integrate's um, experience, which was grounded in this idea that not just more diverse students, but more students in general would be interested in the geosciences if it was clear why it was irrelevant and practical, has ha made a lot more progress in, in at the introductory level. And actually the, the faculty survey data show that in general, we are much better at the introductory level in um, teaching students uh, in the context of societal issues than we are at the majors level. So um, I think if we want to um, use this strategy or explore the strategy, we have to think about not only how we get them in the door, but what's the role of the strategy in keeping them in the, in the, in the program, so. Yeah, and Maya has a follow-up if, uh, you know, could people provide examples of topics that might work well in, in doing well, so? I would, what are, the integrate site would be a great place to look, uh, which has best Getsy modules on it, so. Kathy. <laughs> There's another question. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to follow on. I was curious from what you just said, is there evidence that we're actually losing major students because of this lack of kind of connection with societally relevant issues? When you There's said keeping them in the pipeline. There's evidence we lose. Um, uh, it, there's evidence across the STEM disciplines that we lose students in the upper division. Per, more, we lose more students from underrepresented groups than we lose from or lose, lose from uh, majority groups. Whether or not that's tied to the lack of societal connection isn't as, isn't as I don't know the, I don't know that there's a study that shows that. But I do worry about a sort of bait and switch where we where we encourage people to study the geosciences and introductory level courses by showing their societal relevance and then we they move into a curriculum that is is much more abstract and not aimed at that outcome. More getsy modules at majors levels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So comments that it I, I would agree. I, comments that have come in um, are saying that there's a ramp up, there's a challenge for students who have gone to two-year colleges when they come in to uh, transfer students who come into the upper level in more quantitative courses that they struggle with the math, the level of the math coming from a community college to, um, to a university. Um, and, but there are examples where that can be overcome. And are, are there good examples advertised? Is there information we can share? What, you know, one of these comments came from Andrew Newman um, and Maya commented that this is a challenge at Columbia as well with transfer students. That's a problem that the um, SAGE 2IC project has been working on extensively. Um, okay. and, and they have a big website, a piece of which is about transfer and supporting transfer. So that would be where I would go to look. So that's SAGE 2, you said? And SAGE 2IC. So 2IC is short for two-year colleges. Okay. Um, and uh, as far as everyone is who's listening to, we're going to come up with a, a, uh, a list of the websites that have been mentioned or been cited in the talks. We'll ask the speakers to give us some of these websites so that everybody has access to the information that may have briefly flashed across the screen as we went along. So uh, I'm just, we're keeping notes as we go. Um, yeah, Kapuda Pranoti, she had uh, raised her hand. Uh. Uh, well, Kathy uh, answered before I did. I was about to mention Sage 2IC, uh, Heather McDonald and all her other colleagues who have been working on this for, I think, over a decade now. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, great. Yeah, I think another thought that's relevant to this, but also not only to this, is um, sometimes, because in many cases, our curriculum has sort of re uh, evolved by random mutation. Uh, uh, at, at many universities. Um, but um, long chains of prerequisites are actually can be very problematic. And I, I found this was the case at Michigan State where actually even for the students who come who start at Michigan State, they don't really get into any majors uh, or they, they very rarely get into majors classes until their junior year. 
um, in their sophomore year, they would take intro, but nothing uh, before that. And so you really only have two years with the students. And I, although that seems a little odd to me, it can't be unique. And it's a similar issue uh, to the, the transfer students that where you only have a couple of years. So we, we probably do need to give a little more thought to um, uh, really the sequencing of, of what we require and not, not requiring too many uh, long sequences of, of take this, then that, then that, then that. Um, there's another question that came in, and I think it, it links to, well, I would imagine most of us have experienced this in trying to teach remotely, that we expect our students in some ways to know more than we do, be technical, um, or have those technological skills, but they don't necessarily, um, but in our, it, it, Jim, Jim Knapp comments again, at a state university in a rural state, we're seeing a significant increase in the digital or, or exacerbation of the digital divide, especially with socioeconomically disadvantaged students. So that's existed. We probably didn't know how, how um, severe it was. It, it's now readily apparent. We, we should be considering that as we look forward as well. And you know, well beyond COVID-19. Does anybody want to comment about how we can, um, ways to work, it, particularly with the, the internet. Um, the internet isn't available to all, particularly in rural areas. And, but even so, we still have, we also have technological uh, challenges where we're probably seeing a lot of students who rely completely on uh, computers on campus. Um, so, you know, now that we've learned this, what, what do we do as well? Yeah, I mean, my experience in the last year is they all have smart devices and they all have these devices, but what they may not have is good internet uh, when they go off campus. And, you know, on campus, again, it's not an issue uh, when they're on campus, but what they have available when they move, go off campus or when they go home, or if, especially now when they have to work, who knows, they might have to work from their grandmother's house. Um, it's, yeah, it's a real issue uh, right now, but I think it, it just, it was always was an issue. It was just being, I think, kind of hidden by the fact that they were spending a lot of time on campus where, where that, that divide was not so, uh, so marked. So the, um, uh, in the immediate moment, um, the high schools are all facing the same challenge and they're working very hard at figuring out how to provide access to all of their students. And so it might be possible to work with the high school, for the students in all these different places, because your students have now gone home to lots of different places, to have them, um, to see if there's a possibility of working with the high schools to figure out how to, how to get access to the internet. I know in the small town in Idaho that I'm from, the um, library is now providing drive up internet access where you can park your car in a place and get it's everywhere. And I have students working for me using drive up internet in libraries. <laughs> But I think that um, the bigger opportunity here, and this goes back to your question about what is the opportunity with COVID-19, is that um, COVID-19 is, uh, is, is helping us to see things we couldn't see when students were on campus, not just the digital divide, but um, you know, it, it provides all sorts of opportunities to see um, a different side of how your, your teaching is working. And, and I think it, to the extent that we can really um, encourage faculty to think carefully about how they can determine what's working and what's not working in their classes and for whom, we'll get information that we wouldn't get in a normal semester that can then be translated into improved teaching in whatever situation we end up teaching with when we come out of the other side of this. Could, Kathy, would you, could Sir host a comment page on, you know, it's restricted to a certain number of words or feedback, you know, bullet points, but, but a, a bulletin board for folks to comment on observations and challenges that we recognize now from, from COVID-19? Um, that's a good idea. Right now they're hosting um, a listserv for online teaching that's getting pretty good traffic. And I wonder if one thing we could do is to start to introduce some comments about what people are learning about what's working and what's not working onto that listserv. Um, that's got um, 
uh, several hundred people on it now. I mean, I'm not sure what the, it was over 300 people. I don't know what the current number is. Um, another idea like that would be um, NAGT has been holding webinars and I know they just had a very large one on teaching online and maybe um, encouraging them to run a follow up that would look at it would talk about what you can learn from your students in this um, in this moment or learn about your teaching in this moment that's transferable to the future. And that'd be Ann Egger, right? Mm -hmm. Ann Edgar for the field one or the, the web. I was just going to say, like, I'm on the webinar committee. I'll send an email to Rory right now if, the, you know, if that's what you were suggesting, Kathy, for. That is what I'm suggesting. And, and Karen was, I think we lost Karen. She was on here earlier. But um, yeah, definitely. Sorry, Beth, I should have remembered you were on that committee and just <laughs> sent it oh, to you. Oh, come on, Kathy. <laughs> Karen's still here. Karen is still on. Oh, good. She can also help. She can help make the point that, they, that it's a useful thing to do, that there's interest in doing it, I guess, is what Karen could do. <laughs> She's the current president of NAGT. Okay, so Karen is in a status she can't talk, but she does have a message here on the uh, uh, Q&A box. Uh, she says, yes, I think there will also be programming at the EER about this and uh, Earth, uh, Earth Educators Rendezvous, I believe. Yeah. I think the thing that's important right now is that in the next semester, where we are for sure teaching in this way, helping, encouraging faculty to, to, to really use sort of scholarship of teaching and learning and, and think about what they, what they are learning and what they could be learning, um, and particularly thinking about it across the full spectrum of their students, right? So, you know, what's working and not working for different groups of students, students who are, are um, uh, struggling in the, were struggling in the class before it went to online, students who are were succeeding, students who come from a different background, underrepresented minority students, et cetera. Well, I have something related that's sort of a question for Sharon, which is, which is that uh, earlier someone mentioned uh, about the, whether we could get more funding from industry, whether industry could be working at a national level. And from, from my limited experience, it seems like most um, commercial firms are more interested in working with individual universities. But I'd be interested whether Sharon could comment or whether when looking at the overview, are there, are there, industry, are, are there companies that, that want to work at a broader scale than just with, with a single institution to, to try to, and this will be trying to address this need for some extra funding perhaps for, for, the, under, for the students who don't have access to the, to the digital resources. Uh, from what we've seen, it is just as you said, most companies are wanting to work with individuals um, at specific universities or with specific universities where they're hiring the students. Uh, we have a lot of, had, have, I don't know whether they still do, a lot of industry support from uh, the petroleum industry for our Geoforce program. Uh, and that's the only reason that thing has actually uh, been running for a long time and been very successful. But with the price of oil, uh, chances are strong it's going to be, you know, difficult to get funding. We've tried getting funding from other kinds of, in, you know, industries uh, with very little success. But uh, usually the industry is more interested in where they're hiring the students from, giving them data sets, working with them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, things like that. Um, I know AGI certainly has made an effort to get uh, industry support for broader types of programs and uh, n with some success, but nothing uh, like individual universities do. So we have, we have a couple more questions. Matt Pritchard, who's on the committee, uh, asked, said, the speakers made some great suggestions on how to add quantitative modules to classes. What are some specific strategies to help convince our colleagues to do this and to think about adding them to all courses in a curricular? I like Barb's comments about overcoming tyranny of content and focusing on outcomes instead of courses, but there are a lot of people who are resistant to change. Yeah. Um, is there an article that discusses this? Practices for transforming the curriculum. Are there other disciplines that are doing this better than us? 
Barb. Could I make, could I make a comment on this? Um, so I think, I think it's incredibly difficult to proselytize at home um, because faculty members are well trained, they're intelligent, they put a lot of time into what they do in the class. And to have a colleague come in and say, no matter how politely and nicely you phrase it, it comes across as, well, I don't think you know what you're doing. And so I, I think there are, there are people who are willing to come and do a consultation and bring somebody in from outside who's thought a lot about either curricular reorganization or thinking about how to, to redesign courses if the focus is going to be on a bit more integration at the societal impact level or combining quantitative problems with societal impact problems and putting them into petrology and min and structure and hydro or something like that. Um, get somebody who's got good ideas and who can shake a few trees and can come in and inspire your department altogether rather than you being in the role of saying here's where i think we ought to go um, i think it's it's tough to proselytize at home so, so we, i sorry, i was just gonna to i was just going to say that nagt does a great job with the traveling workshops in terms of coming in and helping i've got a lot of uh responses from departments that said they've had them come in. It's made a big difference. Uh, another thing uh, that has been said by many department chairs is that when they provide the opportunity for faculty to have professional development to go to the Earth Educators Rendezvous or, you know, early career um, events at CERC, that those things really have made a difference because the people come back individually on the summer uh, actually including that in their teaching in their annual evaluations for people asking whether you know have you tried these methods and you know giving incentives for doing those sorts of things the other thing we found is that uh, quite a few departments have said that uh, having this uh, community sort of vetted list of the kinds of things students need to know uh, being able to show that to their faculty and say look employers think these things are important, the community thinks they're important, that that has made a difference as well. But I will say from experience that it's very difficult to change things from in your own institution. Yes, it is. I mean, even if people aren't fundamentally resistant to change, they still have classes that they've prepared. And mm -hmm. when you scramble everything everybody has to to scramble so it, it, there is a natural uh sort of level of some some sort of resistance at at, at some level but uh but um on this sort of topic actually karen added uh we, we've already heard a little bit about nagt's traveling workshop program she notes that there are three there are application deadlines three times per year so uh departments can um uh essentially bring that program to their to their department uh, there were there was another question a comment earlier when we were talking about uh, getting it we were geoforce Sharon was talking about geoforce and talking about industry and we were talking also about state universities with challenges um, and trying to push students out the door um, in an already rushed program but we had a um, um, Mitri Irwin commented that we we have to be ahead of companies, not let them lead us. And he says that, she, she says that as a corporate lifer. So I, I wonder, you know, we, we've mentioned some things, we've talked about industry and our industry partnerships as far as career goals. I think almost all the examples we've heard have been oil and gas and a bit of mining, but we also have been, we're, we're talking about preparing students for um, geospatial skills or for computational skills and geophysical skills. Are we, are we getting examples and are we getting feedback and are we interacting? Um, it is, okay, so there's two, two points here. The one that was raised by um, Mitri Irwin, Irwin about um, being ahead of companies, um, but also in the ways that we're engaging and interacting and again being the leader in terms of motivating new 
new initiatives. Are there things we don't know about? So I'm commenting as someone who's done research for the meeting and is pretty passionate about seeing some of these changes, but um, I, I, there are many things I don't know about. So, so um, I just wanted to comment that when we did the graduate uh, employers workshop for earth, atmosphere, and oceans, uh, and those were people hiring PhDs and masters, we had the whole gamut. We had you know, NASA and NOAA and um, Scripps and major research labs, as well as weather companies and you know, oil and gas companies and mining, but we had, and in both the undergrad and the grad, we had a lot of environmental, we had people who were working on geohazards, we had reinsurance people. I mean, we had the broad spectrum, and I think one thing that came across uh, that really surprised everybody was there was such a commonality in what they thought that was important for students. And it surprised them because it was very similar to what the uh, academic community had uh, came up with in terms of what they thought was important. There were just, I think the difference between the employers and the academic community, particularly the undergraduate level, was the, uh, the depth of quantitative uh, and computational uh, skills that, that employers thought were needed. But we have, you know, certainly at the graduate level, we have done a very broad spectrum. But I also think we shouldn't let uh, employers drive everything. I mean, they are so absolutely ridiculously pushing data analytics. And yes, it's important for our students to know it, but we shouldn't be turning our entire curriculum over to that. Yeah, I'll just add, uh, Bill Walter um, had pointed out that the, again, the national labs were mentioned that the national labs hire a variety of students, um, undergrad, grad, and postdoc, uh, generally uh, for summer sessions. Of course, this summer is up to who knows, but, uh, um, but, uh, but that is another, another one of this, this list of, of potential employers. Sharon, I, I just want to double down on what you just said because, and it goes back to what Barb said, which is, is that our only goal is not, our only role is not to, um, the, the, it is not the case that the only thing we are doing is, is preparing the workforce um, or preparing the geoscience workforce. And, and I think when we, as, as departments, when departments think about planning, um, really having that first level discussion about what is the department believe it's, um, you know, what's its goal, what's its role in, in, in the institutional education, uh, in the institution, what's its role in, the, in geoscience, so that we, we get this sort of more diverse set of outcomes than just preparing the workforce. And that I think will help this necessary discussion about what are we going to do with the two years of time that Jeff has identified, which is what we really have with our majors. <laughs> I guess I, I would say that uh, in terms of data analytics, I think if we are letting students take their own data and analyze it within our own problems, that is very rich and that can mean just going on to google earth and taking topography cuts across mid-ocean ridges let's just take transects let's test our ideas um, that can be building our own data acquisition systems of various types but we can do this all within geoscience very easily and i would also point out uh, this is getting easier to do if you do want to go more technical for instance, Google Collaboratory is also a very nice tool that uh, is a, a very well uh, maintained Python notebook. If you do have internet access, you can use it anywhere and built into it is PyTorch and all the machine learning. So they've kind of set us up to do this when and how we feel like it. 
when, when we want to. However, again, any data analysis where people are engaged with the data to me is going to be rich in the end. I don't think we need to bend towards other problems. Thanks, John. I agree. But I think what we, by doing that, we're actually helping to produce students who are more prepared to go on and do the specific things that employers may want. So uh, yeah, I agree. It's not our job to, we're not just workforce trainers. That's part of what we do, but it's not all of what we do. But, but if we, I think we're actually potentially moving here in the same direction. I mean, if we are producing graduates with more quantitative skills who have experience dealing with data or dealing with modern tools and so on, then they're better prepared to actually take the next step uh, in an employment situation. Jeff, uh, this is Pranoti. I would, I would second what you just said in, in creating these um, career compasses. And by the way, I shamelessly, you know, harassed all these employers that were at the undergrad and grad um, um, summits that Sharon alluded to. Um, if I could actually just write one of these without ever talking to an employer, I would have all the right categories. It's just the nuances of each sort of sub discipline would be different. So if, if you were to create one for me for your specialty, you know, say if you were an environmental lawyer, I could write this for you and you would just tweak a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of commonality in this and it doesn't matter whether someone is interested in an academic career or they want to be a, you know, a technician uh, for some geophysics company or whatever have you, you know, there's lots of common threads. I think one thing that really surprised me when I uh, worked with the employers was how broadly they thought about education and you know, that they were really involved in thinking about systems thinking and geo, uh, you know, systems thinking and, you know, just, they didn't just say, oh, well, they need to know this, 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 and this. They need to be able to do these certain things. They really thought about the, the whole picture as to what students needed to, you know, to solve problems and to, you know, think critically. And so I, I was really impressed. I expected, you know, much more, okay, you know, we want you to learn this. It was more, we can train students to do, when they are hired, to do the, you know, nuts and bolts we want, but we want them to be able to think and create and innovate and uh, solve problems. Well, I'd like to add one more point that is a subset of the students that we're working with, but um, you go back to the comment about, uh, or the, what, go back to pipeline. And pipeline to graduate school, particularly in geophysics, has heavily relied upon REU programs. And uh, we sometimes attract students in, in geophysics um, without math beyond the two semesters of calculus, it's very challenging and often the student has to do some additional, take some additional courses before starting grad school or no credit courses while they're in grad school. Whereas, um, you know, through the REU program, students realize the either to get some computation, uh, programming skills or acquire those in the course of their research experience and also say by doing digital signal processing learn why they want to learn about Fourier analyses and take more math but now you know, we, this summer it's going to be a challenge with the REUs but also we realize that we're we're at limit or we excluding in some ways one of one subgroup and that's the state university students who are only there for a couple of years and are probably already working part-time or maybe even full-time while they're at university um, and they can't afford to drop that job to do a uh, an REU. So without, without that research experience, how can we give enrichment that would enable students to to, to pick up those additional skills. Are there examples of shorter term projects, not in REU necessarily, but ways to, to 
get the research bug instilled in students at state universities. I guess I would say I don't see any difficulty. Um, I tried to this morning outline a number of ways that you could do that uh, within classes, within uh, you know modules or you know short term kinds of uh, projects. There's a lot of things that you can do uh, that don't require an REU, um, and I think a large number of universities and colleges across the country. Uh, are doing some a lot of these things. I mean, even the, you know, what Barb was talking about with the small schools and the you know, uh, faculty working with individual you know, students on projects and things. I mean, you, they learn and they get those research experiences. Um, and it, I guess I would say it's, it's really doable. Well, I don't think Barb's students that were working full time while they're at university, right? You don't have that group, do you? No, no, we don't. But um, they, even though they are not working full time, um, their time is pretty full. So if they were doing a research project, it would probably be part of a half credit course so that it wasn't okay. on top of what they were doing. And so departments might consider substituting um, an elective for, uh, sorry, substituting a research project for an elective, which would mean that the student wouldn't have to take an extra course, spend extra time in the summer, or spend extra time away from a job or family to do the work. And it could be a half credit thing. It could be a quarter credit thing. It could be a quarter credit thing for four semesters. Um, and you could imagine how how much someone might be able to advance the more they the more that they learn about geology and to be able to do somewhat different things in each of those semesters even if it's you know it, it you could i could imagine this wouldn't be ideal but i could imagine setting up research like experiences for students um that aren't aren't quite as exciting as the as the real thing where you really don't know where you're going, but the faculty member doesn't know where they're going. But still, I think there's, there are possibilities for that if you're willing to exchange. And I think I think there's the message here is if we want to do X, we can't just add. If we want to do Y, we can't just add. And so we have to do that curricular and course evaluation that Kathy was talking about at the at the at the matrix level, basically saying what is what is the bottom line here? What is the really most important component of this particular course? And does it really matter if I jettison these other kinds of things? And that's undoubtedly true for a curriculum because if you looked at, well, when we did the teaching structural geology workshop back in 2004, we asked, um, we asked everyone who was coming, 70 people who teach structural geology, uh, we gave them three choices for a list of 80 topics and said, uh, you can choose either, I never teach this, I always teach this, can't imagine a course without it, or I'd give it up. And of those 80 topics, there were only about 20 that everybody said were absolutely essential. And you could do the same thing at the curriculum level. If you lay out 12 curricula, they don't all match, right? And you could say, well, why did they make this decision for this course? We never teach it, we never require it. So. I think if you're willing to think broadly about what goes in your courses and what goes in your curriculum and what you might jettison in favor of something you really want, there are places to put these in. So I would just add quickly that um, I think there's, so there's a whole um, pile of people working on course-based research experiences. So there's a lot of models, particularly outside the geosciences for how research experiences can be put into, um, into into courses at all levels. But I wonder if there's also an opportunity when we create this extra half credit course that Barb has figured out how we're gonna do, to do something that riffs on, um, John, your virtual um, coordinated REU program so that you could get people at different universities working on those in, the, in class, in the course year um, research projects with some sort of overarching coordination across them and community across them that might help 
support them and feed them into the graduate programs. Not sure John can hear. Well, Iris, oh. Iris, and I, this may be true for Beth too, for NAFCO. Iris runs a, you guys all know this, an REU program that coordinates across sites. So there's a, a virtual component that goes across the students who are all in different different places. And you could imagine that playing out in a, in a semester long research project or a year long research project during the academic year. Right, I mean, the way, the way the program runs is it's a, it's, it, the students come together at the beginning of the summer, but then they all go off to different institutions for the summer. So we've talked about, and you know, Michael suggested, you could make it more virtual, and I guess that's what you're saying, is do the same thing, but have that happen during the school year instead of over the summer. But, but you've got it beginning and the end virtual and not face-to-face. -face. Right, but the, the, the difference is where, and where it gets a little trickier is then you're, you're also not the same place as your uh, research advisor probably you're, you're back at your own institution. So that's, yeah. the, that, that's the next level of virtualness, which I think we have to now get to. Right, but, but often John, that is what happens. We, we have these bright students in an right. RU and it's never over. Um, right, that's true. It, it, I, well, you know, well, I, I'm still working with one in Argentina right now right. and it, 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 they're students for life. So um, when, it, when the, the mix works well, but has the IRIS intern program been canceled then for this summer? For this summer, yes, we, we decided not to try to run it because we felt it wasn't, we, it was going to be too hard to actually create the kind of an environment that we want to create for the students. And there's just there's so, so many variables that we can't control, particularly since they're all, every student is at a different institution. So it was going to be just, just too difficult. So yeah, we, we've canceled ours for the summer. It was just, there's just a few individual students that we're trying to work with to, to place with individual faculty. And I may not know all the details, but at the UNAVCO side, they made the decision to take the um, recess internship online. Um, all of the, inter all three of our internship programs online, um, but that's the largest one. And they've hired a, basically they're, I think Donna was like, we're not traveling that much. So we're gonna throw some more money at this um, because we're not using our travel budget. So they've hired um, someone with an expertise in in online education to help them design it and they're getting computers out to all the students and they're going to try to bring in the mentors and advisors it's and i think they're hoping to get some shovel ready project money from the cares act um maybe to help it as well but that's fantastic to, to help the research aspect of it they can run it as it is but they're hoping to be able to research it better with a little more money okay so um we do need to actually wrap up we gone a little past our time, but not too much. Um, so um, yeah, I don't know, Cindy, did you want to have a final wrap up here? I, yeah. So um, as I, sorry, I, as there were, there was one more comment that I should uh, um, mention by Maitri Irwin. She says, I, um, we all read or reread Timefulness by Marcia um, Bjornerud. So I don't know that, but I'll go take a look. Um, I want to say thank you so much to everyone for your willingness to adapt and adjust and be flexible and to share, um, it can't be candid in uh, sharing best practice, um, which often involves worst practice <laughs> and learning. <laughs> no, I mean, so, uh, how do, yes, we, we have, we get to where we are through, uh, through risk along the way. Um, and I think we are all in challenging times that with, um, and evolving times as they, particularly as, as um, anything field related changes or travel related changes moving forward as well. I appreciate all the feedback that everyone's given to anyone listening. We'll collate the website information that was included in, in the talks that have information that could be helpful or, or websites that could be helpful, virtual trips that could be helpful, all of that information. Um, I'd like to say um, thanks so much to all the speakers and moderators. Oh, Torsten Becker said that too. Um, he's just joined us, I think. Uh, Torsten's also a member of the committee and I, I agree wholeheartedly with his comments. This has been a really fruitful discussion and one that's led to some suggestions and recommendations. 
um, for departments looking to make changes and to overcome the tyranny of content. Um, so I think with that, we'll, um, we'll leave you and uh, provide, like I said, this um, to anyone who registered for that, we'll send out a, this list of, of um, websites. And the rest of us then are going to debrief, and the committees are, will debrief a bit and um, look to ways forward from the content of the meeting. So thank you, everyone. And we'll pro be bothering you to uh, ask for follow-up on any, um, or, or check the websites and the web content, or anything new that comes aboard as well. Right, so the subtitle on timefulness is how thinking like a geologist can help save the world. So. You know, at this point, the world definitely needs saving. So let's hope that we can <laughs> do something. <laughs> okay, so thank you, everybody.